You're listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a podcast offered in partnership with Missio Alliance. Each episode, we discuss internal and relational pressures, how they block effective leadership, and how we can move through them to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. Friends, welcome to the Managing Leadership Anxiety podcast. This is our fifth year as we just kick in. And uh, episode number 161, for those of you who take notes to that sort of thing. Man, 2023, here we go, mid-January. We're off to the races for sure. I know many of us already feel like we're in the thick of it. I've got some fantastic guests this year. I'm really excited to share them. I've already done some of the interviews, and man, they've just been off the charts. So I'm excited to release some of these episodes. Uh, Today, it's just me, and so we just begin with uh, the tradition that we do when I'm doing a solo episode where we light a candle on an audio podcast. This candle brought to me by my beloved sister, Tony. I was back in Australia for Christmas and I got to spend Australia with Tony and her husband, Martin, my delightful nieces, Cass and Neve, and of course my mum and dad, Mike and Jill. We all got to spend Christmas together and Tone gave me the coffee snob candle. She knows me well. So thanks, Tony, for that. And I just light this candle by faith as the necessary and needed reminder that God is with us, that God is closer than the air we breathe, that that God is uh, even closer than the light we see with a candle. So here's what we're going to do today. I would like to talk through the science and the art of spiritual transformation. You know, why don't people grow? And what are the elements that require growth? So that's going to be the heart of the episode. I just thought that might be helpful as we kick off January. There's so many people do resolutions. I don't know where you are with resolutions. I I understand they're a mixed bag. But a lot of people do come into the new year anxious or even maybe excited and keen for something to be different. One of the maxims we have on this show is the year won't be different if you're not different. That's the whole heart of systems theory is you observe the patterns in your own life, your assumptions and your behaviors, and along with the Lord, you're trying to break some patterns. So one of the things I'm going to do today is just share with you, really open up what we in Capable Life believe is required for somebody to actually experience change and transformation. After that, a couple of, I think, exciting announcements I'll I'll spill the beans now. I'm really excited about it. We're doing a conference this year. October, we're doing a conference. I'll be talking about it after we get into this whole science of transformation. So we'll get into the guts of this, and then we'll do a couple of updates and announcements for you, and that'll be the show. All right, let's start with a quote. And this quote is from the fantastic Dr. Scott McKnight. Scott McKnight, one of my favorite New Testament theologians, because he is absolutely a proper academic, but he also very much loves the local church. And so his academic scholarship is so accessible to the rest of us. As a pastor, Scott has been such a gift, uh, and his passion for the local church is amazing. So here's the quote. He says, people change when they're on a quest or when they're in a crisis. That's it. That's the quote. People change when they're on a quest, or when they're in a crisis. I first heard that from Scott, and honestly, I don't remember where I read it, or maybe it was on his Jesus Creed blog. I'm, I'm honestly not sure, but it really struck me. I thought, what a fantastic summary of spiritual growth. And in fact, it would have been maybe 2010, somewhere around there, maybe even earlier, that we really, as a church, let that quote be the guide of our discipleship. And so we even started saying as a church, we help two kinds of people, those on a spiritual quest and those who are in a crisis. And we would even say to people, if you're not on a quest, if you're not spiritually hungry, we probably can't do much for you. And if we're going to be really honest with you, we would just as soon you not take up a seat in our church. I know that's pretty bold and obnoxious. I used to get some grumpy emails when I would say that. But What we were saying is we don't know how to help disciple people who aren't hungry or who aren't desperate. And so that's where I want to start today. What are you on a quest for? Or 
are you in a crisis? And crises are tricky, aren't they? Because there are some crises that really get us down to the heart of our faith, where our feet are on the rock, right? The foundation. And then let's be honest, there are some crises that absolutely just feels like it's pushed us off a cliff and we're free falling. Those second crises, it's harder to grow in faith, I think, when you don't feel secure. So I want to be very aware that some of you, you may be carrying more than you can bear. You may have things going on in your life right now that you just feel like getting up, facing the day, doing the best you can and going to bed, that's all you've got. I think that counts. I just want you to know that God is close to the brokenhearted and God is kind. But as a general rule, it's always dangerous, isn't it, on a podcast like this to make generalized statements. But as a general rule, what would it look like if we brought our hunger, our quest to God, and we brought our crisis to God? And also, I just want to talk to leaders. I actually want to before we get to the steps of transformation that we've developed on Capable Life, let me just have a word to leaders, particularly church leaders. I would say, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, I would not worry about discipling everyone that comes through your doors. I would primarily be on the lookout for those on a quest or those in a crisis. That's what we have done at Discovery. And I'll tell you this, that has given us plenty of people. But that keeps us busy enough. I'm always interested in the fact that Jesus let the rich young ruler walk away. He wasn't interested. He wasn't spiritually hungry enough. He had not come to the end of his rope. So first of all, leaders, maybe relieve yourself of the burden and the over-responsibility, what we call in system theory, the over-functioning, of feeling like you and your team are supposed to disciple everyone. That's crazy. Just invite the hungry and the brokenhearted and the people at the end of their rope and see if you can cultivate a community where they get to thrive, where they get to meet God in the midst of their quest or crisis. Also, leaders, this one's a little left field, but I'm going to take the risk of sharing it. Why is it that we as leaders and pastors always talk about discipling others as if spiritual growth is always from us to the congregants. Like, oftentimes a lot of us, I don't know that we mean to do this, but we do do this, we talk from an assumption of spiritual depth, as if we have spiritual depth and we can give it to others. Now, I understand the day you become a follower of Christ, you get enlisted in his army. I get it, that we are discipled and we disciple. I just want to let you know, As somebody who's been a follower of Christ for 35 years and gone through theological training and all of that, I found great spiritual freedom in two things. Number one, seeing myself as a spiritual infant. I have more to learn. Not only do I have more to learn, but I can learn from anyone in my congregation, right? I can learn from a child, for example. I I found when I saw myself just by default as spiritually mature, I wasn't as curious. I was more certain. And my relationship with my congregation was primarily one way. Like, oh, my job is to disciple you. When I started to consider that maybe for the rest of my life until I die, I will be a spiritual baby. Like so much to learn, so many ways to grow. That really opened up curiosity for me, wonder, That gave me the freedom to read more broadly, a wider range of theology, really take in, be challenged, provoked, try things on, experiment. But the second side of that is it helped me to see my congregation differently. It it both relieved pressure, but also kept my heart posture right. Now, here's where I'm going with this. As I look at the 16 or so years that I was a lead pastor, like I've been in ministry 26 years, but where I felt primarily responsible to shepherd the spiritual health of my church, um, it's hard to say, did I teach more or learn more from my congregants? And of course, it's case by case. I, I will simply say this. There are a number of congregants in my congregation 
who are more spiritually deep than I am and are further along in their faith and have something to teach me that God wants me to learn. And, of course, there are peers, and then, of course, there are people who are not as far along as I am that I can teach. But I, I, I just want to caution leaders, it's not as easy to tell as you first think. There are people who have spent a lot of time in church, and just because they've been in church a long time, they automatically assume about themselves that they're spiritually mature. I'll, I'll be honest, when I first came to Discovery, this is back in 2005, I was a young rookie lead pastor. I really was over my head. But I was quite surprised at a couple of people who presumed that they should be elders in our church, even though the way they treated people was quite terrible, even though they approached people with like this spiritual superiority, like they knew and we don't know. And they were really hurt, actually. I'm thinking of two in particular were quite hurt when the elders and I said, no, we think there's some things for you to learn before you you know, uh, apply to be an elder and are nominated to be an elder. And it's because they fell into the very common trap. Look, it, it's not their fault, right? Like this is a systemic church issue. They just fell into the trap of believing that because they've been around church for a long time, they must be mature. I'm not so sure. Don't we all know senior citizens who are still immature just because they're old doesn't mean they're mature i mean you think of oh i don't know do we want to name names i I, i'll take a shot at like hugh hefner you know the founder of playboy magazine even in his old age still rolling around in a bathrobe with young women in their 20s i don't know that that's really a great example of maturity he's old he's lived a long time but is he actually mature And it's the same with our faith, isn't it? Like, as a pastor, I presume I'm mature because I have an advanced Bible degree. But wasn't it Jesus who said that that's not how you measure maturity? It's by love, faithfulness. In in our church, we've tried to make it like if you want to grow in Christ, find someone difficult to love and love them well. That'll help you grow. So anyway, there's just a word for leaders to consider as you approach discipleship this year, you know, something we're all trying to figure out. How do we grow? How do our people grow? What can we do to help our people grow in Christ? One of the things that freed us at Discovery was to realize, let's all look at ourselves as somebody who has a lot to learn. Now, I can imagine some of you who are leading and listening to this, you might have an objection, very reasonable objection. You say, well, I should be an example for my church. And I would say, absolutely, What it means to be a leader means that you are responsible. That's what I think. I think leadership equals responsibility. Somebody has to lead, set direction, be accountable. Somebody has to make the decision, and that's the job of the leader. And therefore, yes, we are an example. Uh, But my question to you is an example of what? Because I think as pastors, we feel so much pressure to be an example of some version of a Christian. What if the example we set is just somebody who's on a quest for Jesus, right? Like if people grow when they're on a quest or in a crisis, what if my job is to stay hungry and focus more on my hunger than my holiness, for example, rather than looking holy, just be hungry, I came to believe that my job as a pastor was almost nothing more than to enjoy God in front of people and enjoy Scripture in front of people. Now, of course, there's more to pastoring. I need to understand the cure of souls and how to help people connect in their faith and in their pain. But fundamentally, what if mostly what I did was enjoy God in public and enjoy God's Scripture in public? I think that would cover a lot, wouldn't it? Okay, so... Just some thoughts there on leadership and growth. Uh, let's let's get on to spiritual transformation. Uh, in Capable Life, not just me and my wife Lisa, but also some of our coaches, we've done quite a lot of work on figuring out, okay, how do people actually grow? And you've heard me bang this gong a lot on the podcast. So I'm not going to keep banging it, but I'm just going to say, as you've heard, you can't listen your way to change. You can't read your way to change. 
So I want to just talk through the five steps of transformation. If you are looking for this year to be different, I want to give you what I believe are the five steps. So I'll give you a step and then a couple of examples in step two. All right, the five steps of spiritual transformation according to us at Capable Life. Step number one, receive some content. Now, what's interesting about step number one is it doesn't have to be in this order. It's just the most comfortable order. When I was a chaplain, content came very late. Uh, what they did is throw me in the deep end was step number one. So I just think the gentlest way to help people grow is to provide them with some material. That's what I'm doing on this podcast, hopefully giving you tools. That's why I wrote the book. That's what our Capable Life online community is all about. Um, but whether you get the content from me or from other fantastic systems theorists like Pete Scazzaro or my friends Jim Harrington and Trisha Taylor who run this amazing podcast called The Leader's Journey, you know, all of us are kind of talking about the same types of tools through a specific lens. It's content. Buy a book, grab a podcast, grab a YouTube, get some content. And of course, there's a number of experts who are thrilled to help you with spiritual transformation that are not system serious, but they still have amazing stuff. So yes, content. Okay. The idea with step number one is you figure out what you need to know when you need to grow. That's kind of the secret to the content because you might be like, well, what content? How, how do I know where to start? What do you need to know? How do you need to grow? That's a hard question to answer. I'll give one option, and obviously this is a bit simplistic. What I'm looking for in my life is where do I keep running into myself? Am I struggling to cultivate a prayer habit? Um, is my Bible reading gotten a little dry? Do I find my irritability getting in the way of connection to myself, to God, to others? What do I need to know? Where do I need to grow? So what I'm looking for in my life is stuck patterns in myself. Where am I stuck? Where do I keep running into a wall? Where do I find myself being stale? These kinds of things. And then go chase content around that. That's step number one. Step number two is intentionally observe yourself for one or two weeks. So once you've got the content, let's say that you're doing some capable life work with me or one of our coaches or online, and we teach you about the four spaces of anxiety, right? So whether we're talking about specifically spiritual growth with God or we're just talking about relational health in our home life and work life, let's say that we teach you the four spaces of anxiety, something we've talked about a lot on this podcast. Well, now you need a week or two where you are intentionally observing the four spaces of anxiety in all kinds of environments, if all you do is binge content, the way many of us binge TV shows on Netflix, for example, if all you do is binge content without step two, where you've got one or two weeks to observe yourself, you're not going to grow, less likely to change. So step one, receive some content. Let's call it the four spaces of anxiety, just as one example of content. Step two, Observe yourself for one or two weeks. Just a little breather where you're sitting with it. You're noticing it. All right, step three, debrief with trusted community. Who in your life can you get with on Zoom or in person and talk about what you noticed and what they noticed? Uh, this is what we do at our church. We gather every other week for nine months and then people can sign up for a second year this is what I do when I do my workshops, when I travel around the world and I, I spend hours sometimes with groups of leaders or organizations. I'll teach content and then I will have them at the table observing and discussing in real time. So step three, after you've observed, is a chance to debrief with trusted community. Boy, this step for me as a chaplain was where it really got powerful, is the chance to sit and talk about how things went with others that we're trying to practice as well. All right, audio podcasts, I'm going to be overt. Step one, receive content. Step two, observe yourself for one or two weeks. Step three, debrief with trusted community. If we can name things, we can tame things. And speaking them out loud is so much more powerful than just thinking about it, especially 
when you're speaking about it to somebody who you feel cares for you and you care for. Safe, trusted community. Step four. (laughs) This is the step where in my workshops, people start to fight me. I've had resistance over the last couple of years. Step four, bravely practice the opposite of what's been getting you into trouble. Bravely practice. The, The shorthand of step four is brave practice. But the long hand is bravely practice the opposite of what's been getting you into trouble. So in my own life, when I discovered that I'm a people pleaser and I received some content about people pleasing and how it's a form of anxiety, and then I noticed myself for a couple of weeks in all the different ways where I was incessantly trying to win people over, then I had a chance to debrief with trusted community. Now it's time to intentionally let someone down. Uh, so, for example, maybe I would meet with a harsh critic and I wouldn't explain myself. I'd meet to listen to them, but I would no longer defend myself. That's brave practice. It was really hard to do. Um, famously, when I discovered that I was obsessed with my sermon performance, I bravely practiced by intentionally preaching a boring sermon. Bravely practice. Those of you who are perfectionists, you have to bravely practice by intentionally making mistakes. Maybe. Maybe you can put grammatical errors in the next email you send out on behalf of your organization. Maybe you could build a bookcase that wobbles. (laughs) Something imperfect. You have to bravely practice the opposite of the thing that gets you into trouble. And then step five, this is the final step. It's less of a step and more of a statement. Time plus a posture. Gosh, I said that weird, didn't I? Let me try that again. Time plus a posture of self-kindness. That's what you need. You know, we're all in a hurry to change, and we want efficient change. We want productive change, but you can't beat time, and especially when time is combined with a posture of self-kindness. That's our theory on how we change. And listen, uh, we have built all that for you on Capable Life, so you can go chase that, www.capablelife.me. But of course, of course, we're not the only organization that does it this way. There are a number, a couple of whom I've already mentioned, but another example might be, for example, the rooted uh, curriculum that a lot of churches are using. Really good stuff. Really just anything where you're getting content, a chance to observe, a chance to debrief, practice, and then time and self-kindness. That'll do the trick. All right. Uh, Before we get to our exciting announcements, a quick word on brave practice, because this is the area that trips people up the most. When I'm doing my workshops, people get all excited. They get really energized by some of, because what I'm doing is I'm I'm naming what you've felt your whole life that maybe no one's ever put words to, and there's real freedom in that. So people are really energized the first hour, hour and a half of my workshop. We help them name and then even notice some things, but then we get down to brass tacks and I say, okay, Who is willing to bravely practice the opposite this week? And boy, do I get pushback. Uh, Not all the time, but there's usually a group of people saying, no way, not going to do it. And there's a deeper science to that. Maybe I'll get into that another episode. But in short, that's because chronic anxiety is based on assumption. And we hold, assumptions hold us in a very powerful grip about what the future will and will not be like if we do something different. That's why we're stuck because all human beings are motivated to not change out of fear, right? We don't know the future. We'd prefer not to live by faith. We like to live by self. And so we don't bravely practice. But for those of you who want to bravely practice, I just want to let you know, brave practice comes on its own scale. There's a four-step scale from the easiest brave practice to the bravest brave practice. So if you want to practice step number one, is the easiest. Watch it on a TV screen. Watch it on a movie screen. Before you start observing systems you're a part of, observe systems that you're detached from, like a TV show. So just think of any reality show, any drama. There's usually plenty of relational anxiety dynamics in those. You know, obviously my favorite, Ted Lasso, The West Wing, The Crown. I I could go on and on. So many dramas. Uh, show relational dynamics. My daughter Kaylee and I last season did a dedicated episode to Gilmore Girls and Systems Theory. You could Google that one if you wanted to. But 
watch it on the screen and notice the four spaces. Notice the anxiety spreading. That's the easiest prayer practice. The next level, observe it in a system you're not part of. Maybe you're at a restaurant and you're just watching the way the wait staff deal with each other. Maybe you're in an airport and you look at a family as they're bustling to get to a plane. Just any group of people that you're not in the system, that's the next level. Step three, now we're getting to genuine brave practice. Observe it in a system you are part of where umbilical cords are not involved. In other words, it's not you and your family of origin. And honestly, it's probably not the family that you have made if you have a family. Just observe a system you're part of, but there's no umbilical cords. Like a staff. Maybe you play on a sporting team or a friend group. Okay, this one's getting closer to home because you're in the system, but your emotions are not so heavily fused with each other over years and years and years. Those are the most complex systems. And then you know where this is going. The bravest of brave practice, observe it in a system where umbilical cords are involved. Family of origin is the final frontier for all this practice. So before we get to our announcements, I'd be really interested in hearing from you. How do you think people grow? What do you think are the required steps? Because my experience is um, people are not necessarily running these steps. They're trying to shortchange them. They're trying to stay cognitive. When I was a preacher, that was true. So many people just wanted more Greek analysis, for example, in the sermon. They want their cognitive brain to be activated, but not necessarily the rest of their body. And so for us, these are the five steps of spiritual transformation. All right. So remember Scott McKnight's quote, people change on a quest or in a crisis. Does that fit you? And then we will just close this section before our announcements with a question that God has asked a couple of people in the Bible. Where are you right now? Where are you right now? God to Adam and Eve. Where are you? My favorite question, God to Elijah, after he had hidden in his depression and isolated himself. What are you doing here? So just a quick reflection for you there. Okay, let's get into some announcements. Folks, we're really excited. We're launching a conference in October of 2023 right here in Denver, Colorado. The last conference we did was the Managing Leadership Anxiety Conference, March of 2020. No joke, we did the conference and shut the world down. The, the, the last day the NBA and the United States were open for business was the last day of our conference. So we have not hosted a conference since March of 2020. And we're really excited to announce for you the Unlocking Faith Conference, October 2nd through 4th in Denver, Colorado. We'll also have streaming and on-demand options. So obviously many of you, I have a global audience, you can't necessarily fly into Denver. Also, our seating in Denver will be limited. So for those of you who love an in-person conference, we would love to see you in Denver on the 2nd through the 4th. But don't worry, we can also provide streaming and on-demand options for you. Let me tell you about the heart of this conference and what we're hoping, God willing, we can accomplish. Our faith in God is our most precious belief, but because it's our most precious belief, we presume that it's automatically our deepest, most core belief. But it turns out for many of us, we have beliefs that are deeper and more core than our precious belief in God. I know for me, this was quite shocking to discover. I had assumed for most of my life that my belief in God was my deepest and most core belief. But it turns out I have a number of beliefs that are deeper and more core, and these beliefs are actually blocking my most precious belief in God. So if we can locate those beliefs and we can bring them up 
to where we can look at them without shame or guilt or condemnation, we can then let those core beliefs compete with our belief in Christ. And we think, with this conference, that uh, that would help you experience spiritual transformation. So, each speaker at this conference is going to be working on a key to help you unlock faith and access a core belief that might be blocking your most precious belief. I'm thrilled to announce that somebody we have so much respect for, he's been a multiple returning guest on the podcast, Chuck DeGroat, will be one of our keynote speakers. I'll also be speaking, and so will my wife, Lisa Cuss. Many of you know Andy Gullihorn and Jill Phillips, two of the finest singer-songwriters I know. I mean, they're, they're not just like their lyric, but the, the tone of their voice and their instruments, the whole thing with Andy and Jill, just amazing. They'll be providing music. They'll also be giving some input as well on these beliefs. Jill is a marriage and family therapist. Andy has done a lot of work in recovery and Enneagram. These are people with a rich well. And then I'm also excited that two of our beloved coaches, Jimmy Carnes and Renee Loring, will also speak. For many of you, those are new names, but for those of us around Colorado, they've been serving me with me in these tools for years. So what we'll be doing between Chuck and Lisa and me and the other speakers, we'll be teaching some systems theory. We'll be teaching some of the science of chronic anxiety and how it numbs faith. We'll look at the nature of every belief, not just core beliefs and precious beliefs, but every belief we have operates in a similar set of rules. So we're going to teach you the rules of how beliefs operate and manifest. We're also going to be looking at the parts of self. Those of you who love internal family systems, parts of self-work, Chuck and Lisa both uh, have training in that. And we're also going to take a look at how trauma can impact our faith. So yeah, it's going to be intense, but it's also going to be fun. Well, our rule around here is the more intense the material, the more raucous the fun. So it's going to be a great time. And the goal of the conference is relief. And we hope we can help you get unstuck and have profound encounters with God. Many of you know I'm working on a book right now called Minding the Gap. At least that's the tentative name. And of course, a lot of this conference is going to be the work I've been doing uh, into that book. So tickets go on sale early February. You can go to stevecusswords.com in early February, but really, if you just go to that website, stevecusswords.com, sign up for something there, and then I'll have your email address, and my email list will be the first to know. You'll get early access pricing, early bird pricing, because we will have limited seating for those in person. We're also going to offer a streaming rate for individuals and a streaming or on-demand rate for organizations that would like to host and fill your room with people. So you pay us a little bit of money, you can sell tickets or make it free, whatever works for you. Um, we're really excited about it. Okay, that's the first announcement. Second announcement is we, we rolled these out late last year, but Capable Life is now moving into offering intensives, four-day intensives right here in beautiful Colorado. And our intensive signups are now in full swing. So just briefly, we offer two types of intensives. Both of them are four days long, both of them here in Colorado. The first is a trauma-informed intensive with my wife, Lisa Cuss, who is a licensed therapist who focuses on trauma work and parts of self and attachment theory. So this is an intensive for one person to meet with one therapist for a week to do a soul care intensive. Maybe you've been going to weekly therapy for a while and you're looking for a turning point. Maybe you're finding in those 50-minute sessions you're never quite getting to the depth before time's up. Maybe you're wanting to dedicate a week to really focus on some trauma or pain or some things that are holding you back. Lisa meets with you for around three and a half hours a day, either for four days or sometimes five days if that's better. And then the rest of the time for you is rest, reflection, rejuvenation. This is an intentional journey toward healing where you dedicate some money and a week of your life to really get well. The second intensive is one that I primarily host. Sometimes Lisa and I host them together, sometimes one of our other trained coaches and I, but this isn't for individuals, it's for groups. And it's not specifically therapy focused, it's focused on the Capable Life tools. So what we're doing with these intensives is inviting eight people at a time 
with me and one other coach. And we focus on the four spaces of anxiety. And for this year, we're really hitting into the family of origin dynamics. One of the things you'll do when you come is you'll present a genogram. You'll also sit in a peer group as others present their genograms. You'll be coming away after the four days really trained well on not just the impact of family of origin on you and your faith, but you'll also get to help others in theirs. So the four spaces, differentiation, life-giving habits, several of our Capable Life tools will be packed into this four-day intensive. I have an intensive available in May. It has two slots left. I'm also doing an intensive in June. You can find that in the show notes and click on the link to send us an inquiry. All right, friends, that's the episode for today. Lots going on around the Capable Life headquarters. Um, let me just close with with something personal. Um, I, I had an incredible 2022, and I'm profoundly and overwhelmingly grateful to God uh, who opened some doors in what started out to be a pretty terrifying uh, shift for me at this stage in my life. So God's graciousness has been amazing. I also got the incredible privilege of partnering with my beloved wife, Lisa, as we have cooked up so much of this together. And she's been so gracious as because I just need to talk and talk and talk to figure out what I think. And as she's so patiently sat through so many ideas as we come up with our products and services to help you get relief. But also, many of you, I know for many of you we've not met, but I've met so many of you in person. And what a privilege for me. You know, the church on social media is in such terrible shape. People are really laying into the church and church leaders. My overwhelming experience everywhere I've traveled in the U.S. and around the world is the church is filled with leaders of good faith and good intent, good heart, good character, who are really wanting to innovate and grow themselves and help others grow. And it has been the absolute joy of my life in my first full-time year in this just to get to share that journey with some of you. So if we have met over this last year or two, I want you to know what a gift that has been to me. I don't take it lightly. Uh, if you'd like me to come out, you can uh, on the links in the show notes, you can submit an inquiry. We'd be thrilled to talk. We've still got some slots available this year. It's a great joy for me to do that. But also on a personal level, I'm just so grateful uh, to God because uh, many of you know my mum has really been battling uh, a very aggressive cancer. And there was a while there in September where the doctors didn't think she would see October. And uh, we got to spend Christmas with her. And so um, my wife and kids got to come down and I got to be there. And we got cousin time together with my nieces and my sister and brother-in-law and my mum and dad. And we just had a great time. And we didn't think that would be possible in September. So, man, I just come into 2023 just profoundly grateful for the goodness of God in the midst of anxious times. Uh, I'm grateful for you. And uh, next week, we'll have a guest, our first guest of the year, Tara Beth Leach will be joining me, one of my all-time favorite interviews I've ever done. So thanks very much. Here we go, 2023. Look forward to catching up next week. For more resources, visit stevecuswords.com or missyoualliance.org. 